Hey, I'm Paul Phillips here with the ISACA podcast. I am the director of event content development, and I'm here with Lisa Young. And today we're going to talk about careers in cyber risk. Lisa, tell us about yourself. Thank you, Paul. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, so I am a cyber risk professional. I've been in the field a long time and uh, I'm super excited to be here. So Paul, what do you wanna know? Well, first of all, tell us about cyber risk and cybersecurity, seems very technical. So explain to us exactly what that is. All right, well, let's just say uh, cyber means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, what I would add to that definition is I would say that we should always think about digital, right? right? And cyber could be technical, mm -hmm. it could be not technical, it involves a lot of people process and, uh, and technology. And so as we think about, you know, talking about cyber, it usually has a component where someone is, is um, unauthorized or trying to do nefarious things at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we think about uh, risk, it usually means protection uh, from harm or, you know, hazards. And so when you kind of put those together, you know, a lot of my career has been in helping organizations understand what could keep them from meeting their strategy and their objectives or their mission. Sure, sure. So uh, because it's so technical, it scares a lot of people away. So let's talk about some of the non-technical, maybe characteristics or traits that you think one should possess in order to be successful in your career. That's a great question. And that is a myth. So one of the things is that cyber automatically equals technical. That's just not true. Um, we need people with diversity of skills, diversity of thought, and diversity of perspectives. And w the reason why I say it's just not true is because one of the most important traits that people can bring to the career of cyber or risk or cyber risk is being curious, asking how things work, figuring out how they should work, how they could work better. Um, and so, you know, part of our mission is to help manage the risk to keep our businesses working and operating in, in you know, to deliver their products and services to others. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey as a cyber professional? Sure. So I actually uh, uh, started as a bank teller. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, I didn't go to college right out of high school. I went to work in a bank. And, uh, and as many of you know, if you've come from, from banking specifically, there's a lot of women in banking because... Uh, most of the people who work in the branch banks are tellers and they're mostly female. Well, it just so happened that it was a large bank and they had a data center. Mm -hmm. So after I was a teller for a year, I went to work uh, fixing and servicing automatic teller machines. So it was kind of an evolution. I learned all about software. I learned about how to balance a machine, run a machine, fix a machine. So I found that I had a good uh, sort of sense of, of of fixing things. Mm -hmm. And then I went to work in network operations. And then I did go back to school and I became a network engineer. So I was a network engineer, a telecommunications yeah. engineer. And I basically, um, you know, uh, figured out how things worked. But what I found over my course of my career is that it really is important to ask how things work and to uh, be able to understand other people's perspectives yeah. in the workplace so that you can make a better uh, product or service to deliver to your customers. Yeah. It's interesting how you said you started in banking, which where there was a lot of women and you ended up in cybersecurity, which I think there's a lot of men, right? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So it is, it is mm -hmm. funny because mm -hmm. I didn't know that this was a male dominated field mm -hmm. and it still is to this day in 2022, uh -huh. it still is a male dominated field. 72% men yeah. uh, mm -hmm. consider themselves cybersecurity professionals. Um, but I will tell you one thing, there's never a line in the women's bathroom. So this is a great thing, but we need more people of all kinds in this field. Uh, and I, I think the myth that cybersecurity is technical is one of the reasons why there are so many male people that come to this field. But I will tell you that um, that's just not true. It's changing. And I am, I am, I consider myself a mentor to bring um, women into the field. And I, I try to do that every place I work and every place I speak. I'm glad you said that because I wanna ask you, what are what's some of the advice you would give maybe a younger woman that's interested in cybersecurity? What would you tell her? 
I would say to uh, be who you are. You know, one of the things that cybersecurity needs is people with critical thinking skills and people that can ask the tough questions about, are we doing everything we could to protect our assets? Do we know what our most important assets are? And, you know, that is not a, a that's not related to gender. And so definitely, you know, as you see something, say something, you know, as you see something that it, that works or doesn't work, don't be afraid to raise your hand. And, and also don't be afraid to raise your hand and say, yes, I'll take that on. Um, one of the reasons why I have been successful and got promoted a lot of times is because there was an extra project or something that hadn't been done before or something that needed doing. And I would just raise my hand and say, yes, I'll try it. And you end up probably learning a lot more and because you have failures along the way. Yeah. So don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to raise your hand and say, well, I've never done it before, but let's figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Now you and I know each other because we've done a lot of work. We have. With ISACA. So I've been with ISACA since 1999. Do you care to share when you started with ISACA? A little bit later. I think <laughs> it was probably 2002 or 2003. Okay. I was looking for what was next for me. Mm. And that was, so I had been a telecom engineer, as I said before, but in 2000, you know, there was the great telecom technology meltdown and I lost my job mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty um, gut-wrenching. So I went back to school and uh, decided to look for some certifications mm -hmm. and some education and to see what I wanted to do next. Sure. And I came across the uh, Certified Information Systems Auditor. Mm -hmm. And that fit with sort of where I thought I wanted to go next. Sure. So I went from engineering to become an auditor. And, um, and what I learned, I learned so much about different parts of the business. Yeah. I think that was the thing that really drew me. But what really helped is that I volunteered as a chapter leader. Mm. And then I, a couple of years later, I added security to the mix, you know, mm -hmm. because I had come from an IT background, I added auditing, and then I went for my CISM mm -hmm. in 2005, I think it was. But what being a chapter leader did for me is it helped me network, Sure. right? And it helped me really understand the larger picture. So important, so important. Networking is so important. So I'd say we have worked together with ISACA. We've done quite a bit of work together. So why don't you talk to us about some of the work you've done with ISACA down through the years? Well, so as I said before, I've been a chapter leader and the chapter leader led me to some, led me to attending the North American Conference. Mm -hmm. And then I submitted to speak at the North American Conference a few times. And then I was asked to teach a class. And from there, I moved into content development. And that's actually when we first met. Right. Uh, because I started content developing in the risk space. And because of the perspectives that I brought from audit, from telecommunications and technical field, from cybersecurity, it kind of rolled up to then uh, I that really started me on my risk journey. You yeah. know, how how to think about these things from a business perspective, mm -hmm. and then how to understand how all the piece parts connect. Yeah. Um, because we are, you know, many of these disciplines overlap a good deal. Yeah. I think you forgot something. What? Didn't you mm -hmm. MC one of our North America conferences? I did in 2017. I don't think there had been an MC before. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a new concept. That's correct. And it was kind of, you know, nerve wracking. <laughs> uh, but I, I think that also at the time was the largest number of people at a North American conference ever. That's correct. So that made it a little bit more nerve wracking. <laughs> but I was asked to MC the conference. And I have to say, it was such a great experience. Yeah. And I think actually they do that now. I think they hire a professional. I was definitely right. not a professional <laughs> MC, but it was just so fun bringing people into the fold. Yes. Like letting them know that, you know, no matter where you're, you are in your journey, no matter what you've done, you can change careers. Mm -hmm. ISACA has so many different career paths and you can change, um, you know, take what you've learned and learn something else, add something else to your tool bag. Sure. I think, I think you asked me about, you know, sharing this journey with people. I think asking questions, but more importantly, learning things and putting them in your tool bag. Yeah. And that is just so important. So yes, I did. I 
that is uh, yeah. one of my ice hockey highlights. Absolutely. So now you've emceed and you taught a lot of workshops for us. I have. That's a lot of public speaking. Yes. So I got to ask you, what tips do you give an individual that is interested in doing more public speaking? Practice, uh -huh. uh, definitely practice. I will say that the ISACA chapter leader role that I had, part of that journey was uh, feeling comfortable speaking at a chapter level. And that actually, you know, I found my footing there. Uh -huh. And then I started speaking at other ISACA chapters. Because if you're a chapter leader, you know how difficult it is sometimes to find speakers. Um, and so I started speaking at other chapters. And then I just got more and more comfortable with practicing yeah. doing it. So I would say the most important thing is practice. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, you and I hold a lot of certifications, right? Yes. We're certified uh, individuals. And there's an argument out there that Certifications are great and some people think they're not. What are your thoughts? For me, they forced me in a structured way to really study and learn something. I tell my son this often, there is a difference between knowing and doing, but you have to know things first and then do them, implement them, execute them, practice them. Mm -hmm. And the more you do them, you learn them. So what I like about the ISACA certifications is there's an experience component. So yes. it's not just uh, taking a test, but there's an experience component. However, there are certifications for people who are entry level. And so what I like about that is that you can get started with the knowledge uh -huh. and then go do something, right? Use your knowledge to get a role and then practice it and then decide if you want another certification or not. Um, but for me, it did, it did actually cement my knowledge of the subject and the practical application of that subject in the workplace. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So let's talk about what excites you the most about your career with risk and security and public speaking? I mean, what's your favorite thing to do and why is that? I think it's to let people know that no matter where you are, there's always a good right next step. Mm -hmm. So if you're struggling with something at work and you're not sure what to do next, there's plenty of resources mm -hmm. and you can go and ask somebody mm -hmm. that you can go and look something up. Sure. You can go to the community forums and say, you know, I have this question or I have this challenge or, you know, and I think for me, what's most exciting is the continuous learning. Yes. Like I'm always, you know, like, well, wait a minute. How does that work? Sure. I mean, my favorite job before I got started in all of this was I was a teller. I mean, I was a grocery store cashier and I loved it because people would come through with the most unusual things in their basket. And I would say, what do you do with that? <laughs> and I would say, and how do you use that? And so, so I think it's just being curious and the continual learning that both the networking and the meeting, like the dialogue we have. Sure, sure, absolutely. You know, the whiteboarding sessions, the brainstorming sessions, the how do you figure that out if you don't know what to do next, right? With this digital transformation that we're on, which I think has even accelerated due to the pandemic that we've coming out of, right. and now everybody's working remotely. What is your predictions for the future when it comes to technology? Are robots going to take over all of our jobs? <laughs> Will there be flying cars next year? <clears throat> what do you think? Well, I don't know if I have any insight into the future, but I will <laughs> say that what I think won't change mm -hmm. is the connection between software and hardware. Hmm. Yeah. I think that, you know, the digital domain in which we live will control more and more of the automation of the water we drink, the food we manufacture, the electric uh, that comes to our houses. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, critical infrastructure and the digital transformation, we're going to need even more perspectives and more uh, diversity of thought in this field. So Lisa, as I said, you and I have worked on a lot of projects together. Now, let me think. I remember the first one, maybe not the first one, getting started with risk is a white paper that we worked on together. Yes, and I think that was late 2017, and mm -hmm. I think it was released in 2018. Okay. And the official title, I think, was Getting Started with Risk Management. Mm -hmm. And that one was a white paper about really just how to think about risk. Mm -hmm. And what made that one, I think, really kick off all of our work together mm -hmm. is remember I, I and others, like, you know, we have an audit perspective. 
And the audit perspective is very valuable, mm -hmm. but it's also very different from the risk perspective. Mm, yes. And so that started our risk journey, Absolutely. that white paper. And then I think we went to risk IT framework yes. and practitioner guide. Yes. So what's that all about? So in uh, I had been a part of the original team that developed the risk IT framework way mm -hmm. back in... I want to say 2007 or 2008, uh -huh. and that was a great publication and a lot of good work was done there, but things had changed and evolved and developed. And so this uh, risk IT framework and practitioner's guide was everything we've learned since the original, uh -huh. plus some new stuff that, again, the field of risk management yes. in this space had evolved, had developed, had matured. Sure. You know, people were using it in different ways. Cyber risk quantification is coming on the scene. So, so the risk IT framework is just that, a framework for thinking about it. And then the second piece was the practitioner's guide. And that really is about thinking about how to put these concepts and these tools and these ideas yeah. into practical use. Yeah. And I think that's probably been like the biggest thing I'm proud of is because then that spawned some other work. Risk scenarios. Let's right? talk about risk scenarios. <laughs> so the next thing we did, oh wait, I think the risk IT toolkit actually uh, even came before the scenarios. Bit, you're, you're right. Right? And so mm -hmm. think about it. Think about the practitioner's guide was kind of the intro to how to. Mm -hmm. Then the toolkit came yeah. and you know some of my other colleagues worked on that with Paul, which yeah. was fantastic. Yes. And those are how do we apply these things that we're thinking in the workplace. Yeah. And then the scenarios came on the scene right. and my colleague Tony Martin Vagie and I worked on them with Paul. Yeah. And there are uh, there's been some released already. Mm -hmm. But those are really also an evolution of the previous work in how do we think about telling the story to business leaders and people who are not risk professionals. You know, how do we talk about risk and something that might get in the way of us meeting our objectives in a way that uses common language that people can understand, mm -hmm. people can relate to, and then how do we think about it, then carry that scenario through to the more uh, control design, to the more measurement skills, mm -hmm. to the more, you know, how do we prevent these things from happening and how do we know uh, how to think about them yeah. going forward. Yeah, so a lot of good work. We've done a lot of good work together. Yes. And we really appreciate the, all the things you do for ISACA. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. And I'll just say that, you know, there's more scenarios coming out soon. That's correct. Um, and uh, we would like feedback on those scenarios. Yeah. Paul and I would because we want to know what's next. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? We want to know what's next. It's always something that needs improvement and what have you. So I just want to start in by saying thank you so much for what you've done for ISACA and you can run, but you can't hide. We want to keep you around. And you've done a lot of great work, not just for ISACA, but for the cyber and risk community. Well, thank so, you. So having said that, as an expert in the field, I'll give you the parting words. What words of wisdom do you have to help improve the industry that we're in as, as a professional? I would say that there's a place for everyone, every mm -hmm. perspective, and that we need uh, we need to keep asking uh, being curious and asking questions. Yeah, great. So once again, I'm Paul Phillips and thank you for joining the ISACA podcast.